Hello and welcome to the March Monthly Minute. Today we're joined by Dr. Shazad Mustafa. He is an allergist and immunologist at Rochester Regional Health. Thank you for being with us Thank today. Thank you so much for having me. We have a lot of questions about allergies in schools and so we're hoping you can give us some information. I look forward to chatting about it. Thank you. So the first one is what is the difference between having a sensitivity or a localized reaction or an anaphylactic reaction? Yeah. So people use food allergy kind of very generally, but food allergy is actually a very specific scientific term. It means that you have an antibody against the food. So the way I like to think about it is lactose intolerance, which a lot of people mm -hmm. understand, versus milk allergy. Intolerance can make you uncomfortable, but it won't ever lead to a life-threatening reaction, for starters. We have great testing for allergies, but not great testing for intolerances. It's kind of just talking to you, hearing about your story. Okay. So if we think you have an intolerance, you t certainly don't need epinephrine because it's not life-threatening. For allergies, anyone with a true food allergy should carry epinephrine. Okay. And intolerances are often dose-dependent. A little bit's okay, but a lot is not. Allergies are usually what we say dose independent. Even a little bit of a food that you're allergic to can cause a severe life-threatening reaction. Okay. So there's a lot of differences between the two. We kind of use them interchangeably, um, but there's a lot of differences. So we want to get it right because it not only helps us with diagnosing it, but treating it also. Okay. What about airborne allergens? So that's a big concern of a lot of parents who have kids with food allergy. Um, if you're looking at the science, you never say never, but it's very hard to have a reaction, an airborne reaction to most foods. The one food group that has been scientifically proven to cause airborne reactions is actually seafood. Mm -hmm. um, the one that people talk about and worry about is peanut. It's actually very, very difficult, if not impossible, to have an airborne reaction to peanut. Okay. And the reason is this. When you're allergic to something, you're allergic to the protein, and seafood protein, shrimp, fish, vaporizes very nicely into the atmosphere, so it can be inhaled and cause an airborne reaction. Peanut protein, for example, is very heavy. It doesn't vaporize, um, and that's why it tends not to cause airborne reaction. So my son, who's uh, in kindergarten, has a peanut allergy, and I can sit right next to him and eat peanut butter and jelly, and it's perfectly safe for him. Whereas, if he had a shellfish allergy, he doesn't, but if he did, sitting next to him with a shrimp fajita with a lot of vapors in the air might be dangerous for him. Okay. So it's actually seafood, not peanut, that is at a higher risk of airborne reaction. Okay. That's good to know. We also hear a lot about latex. So as a school district, we don't use any latex band-aids or paints or any of those types of things. Are there latex allergies that are common? Yeah. So latex allergies popped up in the 1980s with the HIV epidemic when we all started using latex gloves in healthcare. As latex-based products have really gone away for the most part, mm -hmm. like you just mentioned, latex allergy is almost a thing of the past. It is very, very unlikely to be allergic to latex. The two groups of individuals who still are at higher risk of allergy to latex is still healthcare workers, mm -hmm. um, but people with chronic illnesses who are having frequent surgeries, frequent medical procedures. Okay. So latex allergy is extraordinarily uncommon. I do not think it's a big concern in the school setting. What is more common is sometimes you can have an irritant reaction with latex okay. um, that causes a local bit of irritation, redness, itching, certainly not clinically meaningful or life-threatening. Mm -hmm. So yeah, to answer your question very long-windedly, latex allergy is very, very uncommon in 2019. It comes up sometimes when people are talking about balloons, mm -hmm. having balloons in, in schools. So sure. That would be... So that's a common exposure in the school setting, and I would say for the vast majority of individuals, that is a non-concern. Okay. And a lot of people's concerns, a lot of parents' concerns comes from misinformation that's floating around out there. So kind of grounding it, conversations like this, hopefully, where being allergic to latex at this day and age, if you're not a chronically sick person, if you're not in healthcare, it's really, really, really unlikely. That's good to know. Yeah. We also talk about um, cafeterias and classrooms, allergy-free tables, sure. nut-free tables. Tell us about that sure. a little bit. So the, there, are, uh, there is a CDC guideline on the management of food allergy in the school setting. I think people should be aware of it. It's a voluntary guideline. Um, our goal is that kids go to school with food allergies and they're safe. 
but you can never make their risk of reaction zero. You can make it very low, and that's our goal, but you can never make it zero. Life happens. Um, to, as of today, there is no proven strategy to decrease food allergy reactions in school. No proven strategy. So we do a lot of things. Um, and I think the question of peanut-free or tree-nut-free zones or classrooms or tables um, is a somewhat hot-button topic. It's somewhat emotionally charged. As of today, it has never been proven to decrease okay. your risk of allergy. We think it might, but there is another side to it. If a child thinks their classroom is peanut-free and they have a peanut allergy, there is a theoretically over the course of a school year, they could be more cavalier, they could drop their guard because they think it's safer. Whereas in actuality, people are still bringing snacks, lunches, mm -hmm. things are coming and going. So it's hard to enforce. Okay. So there is no right or wrong answer. There's no one size fits all. But most food allergy experts tend not to endorse those things because they're hard to enforce and they may give individuals a false sense of security. Mm -hmm. If a person has an allergic reaction, is Benadryl the first mm -hmm. line of intervention? So that's very important. We want to be prepared, but accidents still happen, unfortunately. Um, there's 30,000 visits in the U.S. in a year for food allergy reactions to the emergency room. So this happens. Oh. For very simplistically, if you're eating a food and you have a local reaction, local itching of the mouth, local rash around the mouth, um, maybe a little bit of swelling, I think Benadryl is okay. Anything beyond local symptoms, epinephrine is the treatment of choice for food allergy reactions. Okay. So if you have hives all over, it should be epinephrine. If you're having trouble breathing, wheezing, coughing subtly, epinephrine. Certainly if you're seeing big time swelling, you know, serious things, it's epinephrine. I think it's very important to realize you cannot overuse epinephrine. If you use it and you shouldn't have used it, mm -hmm. it's harmless. It's not going to cause any bad side effects. But if you should have used it and you don't, yeah. that's when you can get into trouble. Okay. So I always counsel my uh, families, the patients that I take care of, and how we, at home, if there's any doubt, we're going to use epinephrine, and we'll talk about Benadryl lately. Mm -hmm. Benadryl actually does not work fast enough to treat real reactions, and it also doesn't focus on all the chemicals that are going on. Epinephrine works fast, and it hits all the targets that are happening during an allergic reaction. Okay. So epi, epi, epi. And in a school setting, when you use an EpiPen for an, sure. an urgent or emergency yeah. situation, should that be followed up with a 911 call? It should generally be, yeah. Once you use epinephrine, you should seek medical attention. And that's not because the drug is dangerous. It's because you had a reaction that was severe enough to require epinephrine. And anywhere about 20, maybe 30% of reactions will have a second wave of symptoms. Okay. The child will have a reaction. They'll be treated with epinephrine. And then um, anywhere from 30 minutes to up to six hours later, they can have a second wave. And that's precisely why you want to call 911 okay. or seek medical attention, because you want to be somewhere where you can be monitored. Um, and that's also why we suggest having more than one epinephrine auto-injector available okay. at all times, right. ideally. And so, certainly yeah. in the school setting in our nurses' offices, certainly. we have the EpiPens ready and available. Yeah. What advice do you have for parents and for schools to support our students developing independence, self-management, yeah. self-carry as they get older. Sure. What advice is that? So I mentioned earlier there's no one-size-fits-all. I think the management of food allergy in a daycare with little kids is different than an elementary school and junior high and high school and college and beyond. So I think supporting families, children, um, students with food allergies is important. Mm -hmm. um, making sure they are integrated into school, they can do all other activities. That's where it starts, giving them a safe a atmosphere. But I think basing a lot of that on good information, good mm -hmm. science, is really, really important. A lot of people's fears that I take care of stem from things they've heard or been told or seen on the internet, which sadly, as we all know, are not mm -hmm. always true. Mm -hmm. So I think certainly being inclusive of everyone with any medical condition, including food allergy, providing them with a safe and welcoming environment, and then basing policies, strategies, and good science is really the best thing we can do to support these individuals. The sad thing is food allergies and allergic diseases have increased over time. Okay. That's true. That's really happened. Um, so now it's just more important to manage these things because in America, on average, there's two kids in every classroom with a food allergy, roughly. Interesting. Very interesting. 
speaking of good science, what are the trends that are out there now? Is there anything from a treatment perspective or from a uh, new allergy perspective yeah. that we need to know so about? So allergies have increased, um, unfortunately, including food allergies. Um, today, the management of food allergy in America, the standard is avoidance of the food and carrying epinephrine. But it is exciting times in the world of peanut allergy, mm -hmm. particularly, probably within the next six to 18 months, there will be two products available to treat peanut allergy. They will not make peanut allergic individuals unallergic, but they will potentially protect them from accidental ingestions. So you still avoid peanuts, you still carry epinephrine, you still read labels, but if you are to accidentally get into a cookie with peanut or take a bite of a food with peanut, if you're on one of these therapies, it will hopefully decrease your chance of reaction. One is gonna be an oral therapy. Okay what people realize is oral immunotherapy. And one is actually gonna be a patch the size of a quarter that you put on your skin. Um, it's called the peanut patch. And people have certainly heard of these mm -hmm. um, in mainstream media, New York Times articles. They're very exciting. They're advancing the science. They are far from perfect. Nothing in life comes mm -hmm. for free. There are side effects. So we will be talking about this as they become available over the next several months with our patients. That's exciting. Very, very exciting. It's moving the science forward. Great. As a last question or in closing, is there anything else that you think it's important for school staff and parents to be aware of? So the biggest thing I think for school staff is you have individuals at school who have food allergies, but 25% of people who have reactions at school were not previously diagnosed. So preparedness is very important and I think it's Pittsburgh and this school does an amazing job of being prepared, having good information, having epinephrine available, having staff mm -hmm. trained. And if a reaction is to occur, I'm going to go back to what I said earlier. Have a very low threshold of using epinephrine. Do not be afraid to use it. Okay. It is fantastically safe. It is the only therapy for a severe allergic reaction. Um, it is well tolerated. It works. Um, so I want to take that away because there's a lot of fear about using epinephrine. People often want to start with an antihistamine or Benadryl, mm -hmm. and that's probably the wrong way to do it. So if anything you can take away is the safety and effectiveness of epinephrine when a severe reaction is occurring. Great, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mustafa. We appreciate you thank sharing you for this me. information.